All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and get started here on our inaugural PALS TV broadcast. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited to took the time today in your morning to, to be here and be a part of this. Um, we're really looking forward to our agenda and everything we'll have to offer. I know there'll be some technical difficulties, so please work with us a little bit as um, this is our first time as well, um, but we're really excited about everything we have to offer and we'll be bringing broadcasts to you from all over the state with a lot of different ideas and very creative ideas. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you as well. So anything that you may have and would like to see be a part of this PALS TV, please email us, get a hold of us, get a hold of your IFCs or directors or whoever, and let us know what you would like to see in the content as well. Um, starting out, we're gonna be live from Steubenville and Amanda will be walking us through some tours and doing um, some very creative virtual um, tours out there. So thank you again for joining us and we're looking forward to everything that we have to offer. Hi everyone, uh, nice to see all of you that got on. So today we're going to be going to the Museum of Natural History in Washington DC at the Smithsonian. So I'm gonna pull it up. We are able to walk through together and see all of the different things. So right now, what we're looking at is the main entry. You can see we got a big elephant there. We have the mammal hall. We have, let's see what else? The family rotunda, elephant discovery station that's upstairs. Um, I believe over here is the prehistoric hall. And over there is what leads to the second floor. So we are going to go ahead and head in first to the Hall of Mammals. So immediately coming into the Hall of Mammals, we have some animals here. I see a ram, quite a few different rams, and a monkey, a meerkat, a walrus, so all kinds of different animals around here. Oh, got a tiger I just noticed. Monkeys and rhinos. Let's see if we can get down a little lower. There we go. So now that we're a little lower, we have a moose and a few different animals around here. Let's see if we can zoom in and see. Uh, we have a sign that says, as animals adapted to a changing world, a wondrous diversity of shapes, sizes, and behaviors evolved. So let's see if we can zoom in on these. Oh, wait, not virtual reality. No, it's not gonna let us zoom in, but that's okay. All right, so let's keep going. And we are going to head into Africa. So here we see a big old giraffe with up there getting some leaves. Now, so a lot of you guys don't know, and I think you can see in the picture, giraffes actually have black tongues. And the reason they're black is it gives them more protection in the African desert because that's what they used to eat with. And it's also a tougher tongue, so they can eat very spiny and thorny tree branches and things of that sort. There you go, you can see it a little bit better there. All right, so let's spin around, see what else we see. All right, over here, we have a pride of lions that's taken down a wildebeest. Zoom in, there we go. We can see a little bit of a lion skull. You have a short snout, 
you got the big old teeth. So this is our lion skull. And we have a little sign here, both predators and prey struggle to survive during Africa's alternating seasons of rain and drought. It's the end of a long, hard, dry season. The scent of rain is in the air. And it sounds like if we were in there, we'd be hearing thunder, like a thunderstorm is on its way. And just another quick look at everything. Oh, up here, I just now noticed we got a big picture of a male African lion. Wonder if he knows Mufasa. All right, so let's head forward into the Mammal Hall of Africa too. We have some hippopotamuses and a giraffe and zebras. They're at the watering hole. Man, look at the teeth on that hippopotamus. He's a big guy. I wouldn't want to come across him. Okay, hey, what else do we have? All right, we got some places over here. We can zoom in. So this is a spotted hyena skull. They got real sharp teeth, powerful jaws. A hyena can actually chew through all bone, skin, everything, and not leave anything left over after it eats its prey. And then we have a little desert mouse here. He's super cute. See if we can zoom in on anything here. So there's our giraffe from earlier. It's a little fox. Let's see if we can find out some information. Oh, no, nope, that's just the mouse again. Oh, there's our hyena. We can zoom in on him a little bit more. Oh, and over here, I just noticed we have an anteater. And Typically anteaters, they actually don't eat ants, they eat the termite mounds. So they get all that good stuff in there. And up top here, we have a cheetah who's taken his gazelle up in the, into the trees. That way other predators can't get it and he's gonna take a nap apparently before he eats his gazelle. All right, so let's head over, Let's see here, one, two. All right, we got some more mammals here in Africa. So we have a water buffalo and a hare. Some more goats. See if we can zoom in here. Oh, we got a badger. Got a badger, and I believe this is a meerkat, if I'm correct. Nope, it's a gopher. And down in here, you can see all the little gopher holes it's got to go hide into to escape predators. Okay, now we are going to go to, let's see, let's figure out where we've been. Don't wanna get confused. All right, we're gonna go to the Southern Hemisphere Mammal Hall now. So we have South America and Australia. Let's take a closer look at Australia. So we have a koala bear. It's hanging out up in the tree. Koalas mainly eat eucalyptus and they typically do not come down on the ground unless they absolutely have to, preferring to stay up in the trees where it's safe. A little bit more in Africa, or sorry, South America. You've got some monkeys up there. They're hanging up in the trees as well. Back up. See what else we can see. Already, I think we've been over here. Nope, there are carnivores. We have some sort of cat. I'm not quite sure what it is. I don't see the name. Let me see if I can zoom in on it. Nope, it's not gonna let me, but you can also see over here other carnivores. We have some lion seals, we have a coyote, a bear. Let's 
go over here. Let's see what we see over here. Oh, sorry, that's where we were. Can you imagine being in here though? It would be so easy to get turned around. So let's head it into more of Australia. So we have right here, we have a wolf and a koala bear. And there's all kinds of bats and there's a possum. Look how big those bats are in Australia. My oh my. And here's a picture of the Sahara or the Australian outback. Oh, and here we have kangaroos. Australia, land of kangaroos. Why do these two kinds of kangaroos look so different? Long ago, one took to the grasslands and the other the trees. So you can see the difference. There's our grasslands kangaroos, and up here is a, is a tree kangaroo. Let's see if we can read this sign here. No. All right, so let's keep going and see what else we can find. Heading into South America here. Here are the monkeys we saw earlier. He does not look very happy. And there we have a sloth right here. And over here, these are animals that all live on the shady rainforest floor. So what we have are some more sloths and some anteaters. We got a monkey hanging out here. And over here is the world's only night monkey, it says. So he just hangs out at night. Okay. Let's see here. Where have where all have we been? I can't imagine being here in real life. All right, now we're gonna go to the North American Mammal Hall. The North American Frozen North. So I see we got a bobcat here, we have an elk. That appears to be a ferret up there. Let's see if what pictures they have closer up. Oh, well, here's a snow fox. Look how well he blends in with the snow. If you were walking by, you wouldn't even see him if his eyes were closed. You would just think he was part of the snow. There's a picture of Alaska, it appears, and all of the caribou making their way across to find some something to eat. And over here, we have a grizzly bear. He is definitely a big boy. There's our buffalo again. All right, so. All right, so now we are going to head up. We're gonna take the thing into the human origins entrance. Find out a little bit about us. What does it mean to be human? How are humans today different from other apes, primates, and animals? This exhibit shows how the characteristics that make us human evolved over six million years as our ancestors struggled to survive during times of dramatic climate change. So let's see what we can find in here. Got a couple different uh, skulls from different places. This came from Cobway, it appears. Forgive my pronunciation if I'm not pronouncing them right. And let's see here. What way do we go in here? Aha. Into here. So humans of the world today, it talks about our population. Um, a little information. Modern humans have spread to every continent and grown to huge numbers, producing our own food rather than tracking it down daily, has freed us to enrich our lives in many ways to become artists, inventors, scientists, politicians, and more. We have altered the world in ways that benefit us greatly, but this transformation has unintended consequences for other species, as well as ourselves creating new survival challenges. So look at all them people there, man oh man. 
zoom out a little bit. Yeah, it doesn't look like we can go that way. So let's go over here. Creating a world of symbols. This is talking about us when we were cave people using paintings and creating languages and how we would communicate to each other. Okay. So this way, here's a picture of, looks like a cave woman playing with her son, trying to teach him how to use something. Over here, looks like another caveman. Let's see here, let's go to, Go check out the Neanderthals. So this has Homo sapiens, that's us up here, and it shows our family tree. And over here are all the different skulls as we've evolved over the years. Okay. Back over here, it's not where I want to be. Okay, and then we have some more what they believe, folks, and as we evolve, what we might have looked like. It's got a nice man bun going on on top there. I think we've seen him. Okay, so let's see where all we've been so far. All right, we are gonna head over to social life. Group survival, everyone worked together to make sure that the whole, everyone survived. And as we became more and more intelligent, the brain size increased, see how small it was. And as things begin to progress, our brains get bigger and bigger. Yeah, so let's learn about some of our tools. Over here, we have some tools that they used. So you can see here some crude, uh, looks like arrowheads and fishing uh, spears. Right here is an example of a spear they would have used to fish with. And over here is just a different, you know, us now, or I should say a skeleton that's adapted to cold climates versus a skeleton that's adapted to hot climates. You see a different in the bone structure, you know, thicker. That way you could have more body fat in order to help keep you warm. Yeah. Okay, so now we have Lucy here. Let's see what they have to say about Lucy. Lucy is the nickname given by scientists to this 32 million year old early human skeleton found in what is now Europe. Lucy walked upright on the ground and also climbed trees. Glassland, grasslands, shrublands, forests, and other habitats existed in Lucy's area in general. The climate was cooler and wetter than it is today because Lucy could walk and climb trees. She and other members of her species, Australopithecus afrasia, I believe, were able to use resources from different environments. So there's a picture of Lucy doing her thing or what they believe Lucy looked like. And over here, compare your stride. How does your stride measure up with that of the early humans who made these footprints? Australopoc had short legs and therefore a short stride. Later species evolved longer legs and therefore a longer stride, enabling them to walk farther and faster and to cover more territory each day. It means the legs of their strides got longer and longer. All right, into the time portal. 
So what do we have here? Oh, it just shows what appears to be evolution. Not a whole lot in here. I'm assuming that when the museum is actually open and running, they have a video of some sort going on in here. But we don't get to see that with this. So we are going to head to the ocean hall now. Oceans are my favorite, if you can't tell from the background behind me. I love aquariums and anything having to do with the ocean. There is life from top to bottom throughout the open ocean. See a big blue whale there. Zoom out a little bit. Up here, this is a pod. If you've ever watched uh, the movie Titanic, you can actually see one of these being created to explore the Titanic in the beginning of that movie. They use these arms and hands, claws here, whatever you want to call them, to flip pieces of wood and navigate through uh, sunken ships or things of that sort. Over here, these are two lenses that help the individual who's driving it from a remote location somewhere to see where they're going so the, so the robot isn't just bouncing around blindly. All right. So fragile beauty, the art and science of sea butterflies. I did not know sea butterflies existed. So that's pretty interesting. It kind of looks like a cross between a jellyfish and well, a butterfly to be quite honest. Let's see what it says. All right. So the petropods that Canavaw sculpted are tiny sea snails no bigger than a grain of sand. Like other plankton, they drift freely in the ocean currents and swim by flapping wing-like lobes, giving them the name sea butterflies. Petropods come in an astonishing variety of forms, including triangles, cones, spirals, and spiny diamonds. Cavanaugh sculpt sculptures honor the floating beauty of these tiny sea butterflies while simultaneously evoking their struggle to survive in the face of open ocean acid acidification. So that's why we've never seen them. Plankton is super duper tiny and typically it's not seen by the naked eye. So let's see, let's head to our next location. Let's head to the deep ocean. A lot of the deep ocean has not been explored yet because we don't have the technology to get down in there. So what does it take to live in the deep ocean? With food scarce, animals have to evolved to find meals while conserving energy. Sometimes they just use their lungs to pull nutrients in from the water. Uh, the deep ocean is Earth's biggest habitat and the hardest to explore. There is much we've never seen. Mega Mountain, a huge shark, was captured accidentally in 1976. Scientists have recently chanced upon a big, strange jellyfish and several mysterious squids. So you can see a little bit of the dark water animals. Here's a slender snipe ear and a fang tooth. If you recognize this creature, um, I can't read the name, but that is actually the creature you see in Finding Nemo when they're trying to get the goggles and he's got the light on the top of his head. Right here is that light. And there's your giant jellyfish. Right up here is that giant jellyfish. That's a big guy there. I wouldn't want to get stung by him. And there's our blue whale. So let's head over to the ocean portal. So they're talking about salmon and in Alaska, they hunt and fish salmon for different things like caviar and salmon you eat for dinner, to be quite honest. And it talks a little bit about habitat destruction right here and how we as people, you know, we're really hurting our oceans with us throwing trash away and bleaching into the water, chemicals and straws. Save those sea turtles, don't use straws. All right, so now we are going to head to 
the, the marine collections, the biggest collection of marine life in the world. So let's see if we can figure out what this little fish is here. Back from the dead. How would you feel if a T-Rex suddenly turned up? Astonished, thrilled? That's how marine biologists felt when a living colocanth was caught in 1938. Scientists had long thought that the colocarth, or sorry, there we go, they give us a, how to say it, coelacanth, coelacanth, okay, became extinct along with dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Over the next 60 years, other coelacanth were captured off the east coast of Africa. All belong to one species, Lamateria chiluminae. Then in 1999, scientists found a second species near Indonesia, Latimeria mendosis. How many other mysteries do you suppose are hidden in the ocean? I'm sure lots, and there's a, what the fish looked like, because like I said earlier, we cannot get down that deep into the ocean. The pressure is so deep or so heavy that it would crush anything that went down too far. Okay. Portal. And there's just a look around at everything going on there. Go to the ocean surface now. So on the surface of the ocean, that's what's up closer. Those are going to be the fish you see. So here's some fish, a school of fish. They actually swim in a school to keep safe. Just like when we go places, it's safer to go in a group than by yourself. Safety in numbers. What is a microbe? A microbe is a general term for a single-celled organism too small to see individually by the naked eye. And here's an example of a microbe right here. Some fish eat microbes and we can't see them, but we gotta know they're there. Go to the Arctic Ocean now. Woo, there's a polar bear. Are the polar oceans pure and untouched? Few of us visit the poles, yet our influence is felt. Rising temperatures linked to human activities are disrupting polar ecosystems. In the Arctic, dangerous animals rarely use their entered the food web brought by wind, water, and rain, and snow. In Antarctica, some species of fishes, whales, and seals have been over-harvested. A lot of people harvest whales and seals for their tusks um, or their fat that they can use for other necessities such as perfume or lamp oil, things of that sort. And some people up in the Arctic, they actually eat seals. Right there, this is a jar of krill. That is what blue whales eat when they open up their mouth. They're a great big whale, but they don't actually eat the fish. They eat krill. Forecasting the future, are the polar bears in peril? Predictions are essential for managing resources, but they always contain uncertainties. Will, will current trends continued? Have we gathered all relevant data? What new factors will have an impact? Scientists continually re-examine and revise their forecasts. So here is a graph that it can show you just the decline. The polar oceans are growing warmer. This has powerful implications for organisms living there and for us. Polar bears, for instance, hunt from sea ice, gather, gaining most of their weight in winter. But with the sea ice declining and breaking up earlier, bears have less time to hunt. How does polar warming touch us? Polar sea ice helps regulate Earth's climate. White ice reflects more of the sun's energy back into space than does dark water. Without sea ice, Earth would absorb more solar radiation and our climate would be much warmer. So our hot summers would be even hotter and we might even not have winter. And up here we have some different shells. We got some starfish. We have sand dollars here. We have a proboscis worm. Ooh. And then we have a south polar limpet, which kind of looks like a snail, 
The limpid dominant and Antarctic intertidal communities grazes on microbes and microfauna on rocks. So they're kind of like a snail. They help to clean up the ocean. Okay. Let's go to the shores and the shallows. Zoom in, we have a whelk shell, a Galapagos batfish, a bobtail squid. There are some sea urchins. Some people actually eat sea urchins. It's pretty popular in Japanese culture. I know I've seen it a few times on a sushi restaurant menu. Down here, we have, looks like an anglefish. Yep. They're big. And there's some more of the sea urchins. Let's see what else we see around here. So here we have a crane and they eat small fish in the ocean as well. Okay, let's head to the cliffs. All right, welcome to the coral reefs. In a lot of places, coral reefs are actually beginning to disappear due to pollution fishing, and coral reefs actually take a very long time to repair themselves. So up here we have coral reefs are always teeming with life. They're a good place for fish to hunt. Many, many, many different species of fish that live there. And over here, I think I see a giant squid. He is definitely a big guy. Up here, we have a skeleton of an eel. I'm gonna zoom out just so you can kind of see everything. And right here, here is a section of what a coral reef would look like. If you can see, you got the blue tangs there. You have all the animals hiding in and amongst the coral reef for safety. Okay, and this is from up at the top. This is that blue whale I told you about. And if you see right here, these little things, that is how he filters the krill into his mouth. So this is just a top view of where we just were. Let's head on back down and see if we can figure out what the skeleton is. I saw it there earlier. See if it'll tell us. I believe that's a form of prehistoric crocodile or something by possibility, but I do not know, guys. I don't see a name. Wait, what's this over here? Uh, nope. All right, so next we are heading off to the special exhibit. Let's see if what we can see around here. What would life be like without an ocean? All organisms need water to exist and the earth has plenty of it. Without the ocean, this planet would be a barren desert. It would not have a stable and moderate climate. It would not have an ample oxygen supply and it probably wouldn't have you. So we'd be like many, other, many of the other planets in our solar system that just have no life on them because there is not enough water to sustain life. What is this thing here? Let's see. Crinoids such as, such as this reach 20 meters long. They often lived in colonies and attached to logs. So this would have been a prehistoric creature. Our where does it live section. 
just a few different things. You got a lobster. Okay. Off to diversity. Over here, we have, I believe this is a science ship. This is where they would have they would launch those robots that I showed you earlier in the broadcast from. Um, they explore ocean life from these and they will stay in the ocean for weeks and months at a time as they discover new things about the ocean. The ocean floor is like a giant time machine. The deeper we dig, the farther back we go. Ocean sediments accumulate from eroded rock, bone shells, lava, and volcanic dust and other materials. The mix of ingredients varies over time, so analysis of sediment can tell much about conditions when each layer formed. Fossils and other buried evidence record the history of the plants and animals that lived there. So that's how they can tell how long ago something happened. They can actually do that on Earth too by doing a core sample where they dig down into the ground and see how far down, what the different layers say. Let's go to the second hall. Cause the extinction. So these are gonna be prehistoric animals that died off. As we know, as animals evolve, um, old species often will become extinct and disappear. And I think we're about done in the ocean world. We have been to a lot of these different locations in here. Yep, we are back to where we were. And our time is almost up. So we are going to just do a real quick return back to our elephant. And this is the waiting room again at the beginning of the, thing, of the museum and it takes you everywhere you wanna go. So tomorrow, please feel free to tune in and we will explore more of the Smithsonian. We still have the African Voices exhibit to go to. It will go all through Africa. And then we also have it, it's a very big section down here we have our David H. Coach Hall of Fossils in Deep Time. So this is where we will have all of our dinosaur bones and all the things that were way before us. So we will explore that more tomorrow if you tune in. And you guys can always explore this site on your own and walk through the exam excuse me, and walk through the museums and exhibits on your own by going to naturalhistory2.si.edu. Um, That'll take you to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Feel free to check out the website and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Amanda. That was a terrific You're welcome. Tour. Really appreciate that. It was a wonderful no his problem. history. Absolutely. Learning about Smithsonian coming from Steubenville. So that's the interesting concepts we'll be bringing to you. So greatly appreciated. You know. Absolutely. You. It was nice to hang out then, with everyone. Absolutely. And then we'll be bringing you uh, the tour again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. live yep. from Steubenville with Amanda. So we appreciate it. So right now we're gonna be taking a, a short break. So typically between our segments, there'll be about 15 minutes um, to allow our next group to begin to put some of their materials together for you. So, uh, the next one will be live from Gallia County and we'll be doing some ceramics and other things with Rankin and Dave down there. So really looking forward to that. and. Again, if there's any feedback, if there's anything you'd like to see as well involved in PALS TV, we'd love to hear from you. So 
Um, join us back again. It'll be probably be at the top of the hour for each segment. So, you know, you know, we'll be getting them at 11, 12, 1, 2, and 3 the rest of the day. So thanks again. See you soon.